Everybody, um, I'm grateful that you're all here. So Shir is going to say good night. This is my son Shir. Actually, his Hebrew. Good night. His good Hebrew. Night. Yeah. My little. Yeah, me <laughs> His See Hebrew birthday is on Tisha B'Av. So uh, fitting that he he made uh, an appearance. So two years ago on this day, he was born on this day in the Hebrew calendar. Um, so I'm grateful to be here together in community tonight. Our Tisha B'Av observance is different this year as we are coming together online on, on Zoom um, to mark this day. Um, so much is different from, from last year and, um, and we've had this, this holiday um, with us in, in our tradition through generations um, to guide us in, in coping with, with grief and, and rupture. So tonight we begin this yearly observance of Tisha B'Av, which is the most sorrowful day in the Jewish calendar. On this day of communal mourning, we commemorate the destruction of both the first and second temples in Yerushalayim in 586 BCE and 70 CE. It's become a day of grieving in the wake of many traumas and tragedies that we've experienced as a Jewish people. It's a day of remembering devastating events that rent the fabric of Jewish life and shattered the sense of order, meaning and purpose for our ancestors and for our ancient rabbis. The book of Eicha, known in English as Lamentations, which we chant on Tisha B'Av, captures this experience of chaos, displacement, and disorientation. Echa in Hebrew means how. How is this possible? And, and the book begins. Echa yashva vadad ha'ir abati am haitake almana. The book begins with a question, how? How is it possible that the city once teeming with people sits alone? How is it possible that she who was great among the nations has become like a widow? How, how did it happen, Echa? How did it happen that she who was a princess among states has become a hostage? Echa opens with a question that is churned up from a state of grief and shock. Echa, how? How is it possible that this is happening? It's a question that's directed at God, at ourselves, at the universe. Echa, how can this be real? Echa. And this question has felt so fitting in our present moment. I've been asking myself, I'm hearing this refrain in, in my mind over the past months, Echa. Theologian Kathleen O'Connor describes how the book of Echa marks out the place of ruptured life when the old story fails and a new one has yet to appear. And so on Tisha B'Av, we sit in this place where the old story fails and the new one has yet to appear. The book of Lamentations is made up of multiple narrators and voices bearing witness to the horrors of the destruction of the temple at the hands of the Babylonians. And notably, one voice is missing from the text. The voice of God is absent. As Kathleen O'Connor describes, the absence of God's voice serves to symbolize this vacuum of meaning this liminal world of impasse, this time when the old life has ended and no new imaginings are yet possible. So I want to just lift up her, her phrase again. 
The absence of God's voice serves to symbolize this vacuum of meaning, this liminal world of impasse, this time when the old life has ended and no new imaginings are yet possible. And this language has, has resonated with me um, during these times, being in a space where the old story has failed, life has ruptured in the context of this pandemic, and the new story has yet to appear. Reb Ami Silver describes Tisha B'Av as a day of asking questions that have no answers, of encountering the baffling pain of God's silence, of being in a place where there are no words. And so I want to look at one rabbinic text which speaks to God's silence and this idea of being in a place of, of ruptured life where the old story has ended and the, and the new one has yet to begin. So I'm going to share uh, this text with you on the screen. Okay, here we go. Um, so this text comes from the Talmud Bavli from Masechet Gitin, and it describes horrors that, that happen when Jerusalem was occupied and the, and the temple was invaded, it says that Vespasian went back to Rome and sent Titus in his place. And the Gemara cites a verse that was expounded as referring to Titus. It comes from Devarim, it says, and he shall say, where is their God, their rock, in whom they trusted? This is the wicked Titus, who insulted and blasphemed God on high, who was saying, where is their God? in a mocking tone. And the Gemara continues, what did Titus do when he conquered the temple? He took a prostitute with his hand and entered the Holy of Holies with her. He then spread out a Torah scroll underneath him and committed a sin, engaged in sexual intercourse on it. Afterward, he took a sword and cut into the curtain, separating between the sanctuary and the Holy of Holies. And a miracle was performed and blood spurted forth Seeing the blood, he mistakenly thought that he had killed himself. And here the understanding is that the term himself is a euphemism for God. Titus saw the blood coming forth from the curtain in God's meeting place, the temple, and took it as a sign that Titus had succeeded in killing God himself. As it is stated, your enemies roar in the midst of your meeting place. They have set up their own signs for signs. And the Gemara continues, Abba Hanan says in the book of Psalms, the verse states, who is strong like you, O God? Who is strong and endure it like you as you hear the abuse and the blasphemy of that wicked man and remain silent, right? So here the rabbis are remarking on God's silence, on the absence of God's voice, um, not only being this place where one story ends and a new one is yet to begin, but, but um, they're calling out God for being silent. How could you, God? How could you be silent witnessing this horror? And there's a midrash, so the school of Rabbi Ishmael taught that the verse um, that we read, it's in our liturgy, it's in the, the Song of the Sea. Mi kamocha be'ilim Adonai. Who is like you, O Lord, among the gods? Uh, he reads it as, who is like you among the mute? Um, so he takes, takes the words and he flips around, the, he plays with the letters. He says, we shouldn't read the verses, who is like you among the gods, but who is like you among the mute? For you conduct yourself like a mute and remain silent in the face of your blasphemers. So it's a strong rebuke. Um, in this text, we feel the rabbis taking note of God's silence and of responding with, with outrage and with a question. 
that in their echa, in their asking, how is this possible? They are saying to God, how could you let this happen? And there are no answers. We don't receive answers. Um, and yet the question is lifted up, the question that has no answers. And on this day, we are given permission to go there, to ask the questions that have no answers, um, to respond to God's silence with everything that may come up, whether it's anger or, or grief or shock um, or our own silence or inability to find the words to respond in this moment. But this begs the question, what do we do with this void? What do we do in this place, in this time, in this silence after the question, Echa, when the old story fails, when the new one has yet to appear? And so I want to share uh, a possible response that is woven into the way we observe this day. I want to talk about how we move from silence to lament. And I'm going to share a Hasidic story about the, the Kutzker Rebbe, Menachem Mendel of Kutsk. So the Kutzker Rebbe was very dedicated to truth. And he spent the last 20 years of his life in his study, which he rarely left, um, and where he only seldom received visitors. And one of his closest friends was Rabbi Yitzchak of Vork, the Vorka Rebbe. And they were so close that Rabbi Yitzchak named his younger son, who was his successor, Menachem Mendel, after the Kutzker Rebbe. Father and son were so close, they were always seen together. And we're told that if Rabbi Yitzchak had to leave his son to go on a journey, they would write to each other every day. Rabbi Yitzchak died, and his son Mendela could not be consoled. But because he and his father spoke every single day, he still expected that he would hear from his father in some way. Maybe in a dream, and he waited and waited, but no message came. So a month after his father's death, Mendela went to the Kutzker Rebbe to visit and to ask the Kutzker Rebbe why no word had come from his father. The rabbi of Kotsk said, Mendela, I share your grief over the death of your father. He was my closest friend, and I too expected him to contact me from the world to come. And I'm surprised that he hasn't. And since he had not, I decided to go up to him. So the Kutzker explains to, to, the, to Mendela, the Borka Rebbe's son, he says, I pronounced a holy name and my soul flew up to heaven and I ascended all the way to Yerushalayim, Shalmala Yerushalayim on high. Because just as there is a city of Jerusalem in the Holy Land, there's also one in heaven. And I knew that all of his days, your father longed to be in Jerusalem. And so I was certain that I would find him there. So before long, I found myself standing before the Beit Migdash, the temple on high, suspended in the heavens. Um, and the, and the Kutzker Rebbe explained that although the temple on earth was torn down long ago, there's still a Beit Migdash up in the heavens. And I saw angels there entering and departing in great numbers. And I went to them and I said, have you seen Rabbi Yitzchak? And they said, yes, he's been here, but, but he left. So I left there and I flew through all of the palaces of heaven, the Kutzker Rebbe says. For all of the great prophets and sages have their own palaces in the world to come where they continue to teach the Torah. I went to the palace of Rashi, the great commentator. And there I was told that yes, your father had been there, but he had left. Then I rose up through the palaces of Rambam, of Rabbi Akiba, even those of Moshe and Abraham. And everywhere I went, I asked, have you seen Rabbi Yitzchak? And everywhere I went, they told me, yes, he has been here but he left. So finally, the Kutzker says, I called upon the angel Gabriel, and from him, I learned that if I wanted to find your father, 
I would have to search for him in a dark forest at the ends of the earth. So I girded my strength and entered that endless forest. And all the while I wondered what your father was seeking in that dark place. For what felt like a lifetime, I made my way through the forest. And then when I reached the end of it, I saw the strangest sight, a mighty ocean with waves that rose up very high. And as they rose, and as they fell, they made a sobbing sound. And there by the shore, I saw your father. I saw Rabbi Yitzchak leaning on a staff and I said, Yitzchak, it's me, Mendel. I found you at last. And your father said, Mendel, come here. I have something to show you. And when I stood beside him, he pointed to the ocean and he said, do you know what this ocean is? I turned to that strange ocean and I saw how high the waves rose up and I heard its moaning and its sighing and its sobbing. And I said, no, never have I seen such an ocean. What ocean is it? And Rabbi Yitzchak said, know that this is the ocean of tears, of all of the tears shed by Israel, of all of the tears shed by God's beloved children. And the waves of this ocean cry out to God. And that is why there is the sound of sobbing. I could have spent eternity in the heavenly Jerusalem, but I have vowed never to leave this place until God dries all the tears. I've been praying day and night. Will you pray with me? And the Kutzka Rebbe says, yes, yes, of course. And he tells Mendela, your father and I prayed together. Never have I prayed so hard. Tears fell from our eyes into the ocean of tears. And then a miracle took place for each time one of our tears fell into the ocean, the waters went down a little further until at last the ocean was dry. Then all at once, a great rainbow filled the heavens, the most beautiful rainbow I had ever seen. The sight of that rainbow filled me with hope, for I was certain it was the same rainbow that Noah had seen. Then I knew it was time to take my leave of your father and return to this world. We embraced and he asked me to assure you that you would be hearing from him very soon. Now, when young Mandela heard these words, he wept tears of joy. And that night he dreamed that he and his father were standing together inside the celestial temple in Yerushalayim, Shalmala, heavenly Jerusalem, surrounded by joyful sages and angels. And a wonderful light shone from his father's face. So I find this story so powerful, this image of Rabbi Yitzchak saying, I'm not going to go to heaven. I, I'm going to stay here at this ocean of tears, God, until you hear the cries. I'm going to cry along with all who cry until you notice, until you do something about this. And I, I think this story is powerful as well, right? This image of the Kutzker following Rabbi Yitzchak through all of the, the, the Torah commentators. Um, um, and I think in the story, perhaps they stand in for all the words that are uttered to try and explain things, words to try and give comfort. And then he follows Rabbi Yitzchak through this endless dark forest, this abyss, this place of silence where there are no words, that space of the silence after the question of Echa. And then they land at the, the ocean of tears. And I think there's a, a wisdom to this day of Tisha B'Av. And in a way, you know, I, I want to pause. I think the story could stop with them at the ocean of tears. And in some versions, it does. 
in the version I shared, there's an, an ending as well. Um, a place beyond the tears, that through the tears, um, there is uh, a reconciliation that, that happens. Um, the symbol of the rainbow that is a symbol of the covenant. Um, and Tisha B'Av commemorates the rupture of our relationship with God. And after Tisha B'Av, there is again this possibility for rebuilding the covenant. But the covenant is never the same. Um, we never forget what's happened. We never forget uh, the trauma that all have been through. Um, and yet there's a way somehow, somehow to rebuild after this. Um, I think there's a, a wisdom in the way we observe the day of Tisha B'Av. We have three weeks of mourning on the way into sitting at the ocean of tears of Tisha B'Av and coming out of it it takes a number of weeks to, to find consolation. Consolation doesn't come easily. Our rabbis ask us in this time of year to sit in the void, to allow ourselves to sit in the depths of our grief, to bear witness to the suffering in our history, in our world, and in our own souls, to engage with the grief to walk through the dark forest together, to sit on the shores of the ocean of tears, to listen to the sobs, to feel the searing absence of all we have loved and lost, to bear witness to the silence of God. And even though there are no words that can do justice to the pain and to the loss, we give voice, we cry out from that silence. The prophet Jeremiah speaks of Rachel weeping for her children. Ko amar Adonai kol nishma. Thus says God, a voice is heard in Ramah, lamentation and bitter weeping, Rachel weeping for her children. She refuses to be comforted for her children because they are no more. And we read in Echa, Al Ele Ani Bochia, Eni Eni Yorda Maim, Kirachak me many menachem meshiv nafshi. For these things do I weep, my eyes flow with tears. Far from me is any comforter who might revive my spirit. My children are forlorn, for the foe has prevailed. And this year, as we weep for the temples in Jerusalem, we weep for many things. We weep too for the sea of losses in this global pandemic. 152,343 people who have died in the United States. 664,172 people around the world. We weep with the mothers who weep for their children, beloved children of God who have died, parents, grandparents, siblings, partners, friends, teachers, mentors, students, doctors, artists, rabbis, leaders, grocery store clerks, good people, elders who are gone. We weep for many losses. We weep for the isolation and separation. We weep for lost dreams, for canceled celebrations, for missed chances. We weep for the hunger, for food and work. We weep for the thirst for justice and connection. We weep for the greed we weep for those who turn a blind eye towards the suffering of others. We weep for those killed by the horrors of senseless hatred. We weep for the terror of anti-Semitism and racism and transphobia. We weep 
for our Jewish siblings who were killed in a kosher supermarket in Jersey City. Still, we weep for those who died in the Tree of Life Synagogue in Pittsburgh. And we weep for people of color, for black and brown people in this country who have lost their lives to the brutality of white supremacy. We weep for George Floyd, Ahmaud Aubrey, and Breonna Taylor. We weep for refugees stripped of their dignity and separated from their families. We weep for the earth heating up, for the species lost to extinction, for people facing drought and famine. And there are many things to weep for and I wanna sit here for a moment as we are watching the sky get darker, as we are moving into this day of Tisha B'Av, to sit at the shore of the ocean of tears together and to offer an opportunity as well for all of you who are gathered here to listen within. And if there's something you wanna share that you weep for, if you'd like to take out a pen or a piece of paper, if you'd like to type something into the chat box, you can either write it to everyone or if you want it to be anonymous, you can write it to me and I'll read it aloud. And just take three moments now of silence, just to take a moment uh, for each of us gathered here. What is it, this Tisha B'Av that you are grieving? We weep for the homeless, the mentally ill, the victims of hundreds of years of racism in this country, for the victims of the Holocaust and Jewish martyrs through the ages. Um, and if we want to respond as we hear these, we can all say together, Eicha, Eicha. I wept this week over the loss of a great human, John Lewis. I will make a concerted effort to read his speeches and the books about him soon to be published. Great humans like him are a rarity. And if anyone else would like to share something in the chat or you're welcome if you'd like to speak it out loud. I'll look around the room and see if anyone has a hand up or if you'd like to just hold it where you are. That's okay too.
thank you for taking the time to to be in this space um, and I hope over the course of the day coming up if there is a way um, that you can connect to what it is that you are mourning for right now or to have others bear witness at any time we're, we're gathered together um, over the course of the day, if you want to reach out, I um, want to invite you to, to share if you feel comfortable uh, doing so or take some time on your own um, to name these losses. And I hear a few others. I grieve for the madness of all the science deniers in our country whose blindness endangers us all. Eicha. I weep for transparency, honesty, integrity, truthfulness. Um, so on Tisha B'Av, we sit in this space um, and we, we weep for the loss of our parents. Why must we be orphaned? Echa. I weep for my coworker who passed from COVID less than a year after being freed from incarceration and was going to do amazing things. Echa. We bear witness with one another. We sit on the shore of the ocean of tears. I grieve for the loss of the love for truth, the loss of the love for justice. Echa. we sit here together and there's a custom on Tisha B'Av of not greeting one another. And perhaps this comes from this place of struggling to find the words. And we don't have to find the words. We can be with each other in the silence. We can be with each other in the tears. We can sit with each other in the dark. And the day doesn't end here, and the narrative doesn't end here either. Rabbi Nachman of Breslov has a really powerful teaching. So he, he speaks about, there's a, a concept in the study of Talmud um, in rabbinic thinking called a teku, when the rabbis have a debate and there's a tie. And um, the disagreement, the debate, the uncertainty, Teku means let it stand. Um, and we're told that we're just going to have to wait until Elijah the prophet arrives and Mashiach arrives to solve these difficulties and problems. We're not going to know the answer. So Rabbi Nachman um, connects the word teku. He says the same Hebrew letters almost with the word tikkun, uh, which means repair. And there's a missing nun right at the end. Um, and how do we move from this space of, of teku, of uncertainty, of sitting in the unknown and the unanswerable questions to a place of, of doing tikkun, of having the agency to take on the work of repair? So he plays around again with the letters of the word tikkun. And from the word tikkun, you can make the word kinot, which are cries of lamentation, the same, the same Hebrew letters. So he teaches that we move from teku, from this space of the unanswerable questions, um, to tikkun, a place of repair, through a pathway of keynote, of crying out, of lament. 
And that's how we're able to, to find agency again, to reclaim agency, to choose life and, and move forward after the rupture, to build a new narrative and to rebuild our lives and choose lives and choose life. Um, and um, so I was moved um, by thinking about this and we think also about, right, our, our initial narrative that we have in the book of Exodus that um, under oppression, initially our people can't even cry out. We moan, we don't have language, we don't have words and we cry out and God hears those cries. And that is how the, the story of redemption begins. So on Tisha B'Av, we sit in the silence, we sit in a place where we have no words, and we also cry out. We find ways to cry out and express our lament um, in order to find the agency to move forward. Um, one of the things that I greatly admire about our Jewish calendar is that we are on a, a lunar, our calendar is oriented around a lunar cycle in the waning and the waxing of the moon. And we have to hold out hope that the light will return. And in the meantime, we sit with one another in the darkness. Rabbi Sharon Brouse writes, the moon plants in our hearts an eternal message. The light of hope that emerges in the dark of night is not steady and consistent. It's fluid. Sometimes it's brilliant and bright and ambitious, and sometimes it's but a sliver of, bright, of light. When I think about the seemingly intractable problems we face and all of the uncertainty, I try to remember that when we feel stuck, the ground under our feet is in motion, the earth is turning and traveling on her path around the sun, our cells are regenerating. Breath is moving through us. When we are frozen in despair, things are happening beneath the surface, invisible to the eye, as the light of the moon swells and subsides. The Hasidic masters teach that on the Shabbat before Tisha B'Av, Shabbat Chazon, the Shabbat of vision, we're granted a vision of the third temple. And whether or not we believe there should be a next installment of the temple, it's a powerful teaching that precisely in this moment, as we stand at the edge of the abyss, we are given a glimpse of Geula, of redemption. Something in our souls perceives that despite everything, redemption is still possible. Our spirits sense that there will be a way out and back and forward for our people after exile. Though we can't imagine what it will look like, we have hope that there will be a future. By bearing witness to what is broken, by sitting here in the uncertainty, by expressing our lamentations, we make space for new openings. By being in that teku and holding it and staying there and expressing our keynotes, we find a way towards tikkun. In her gorgeous book, Hope in the Dark, uh, the writer Rebecca Solnit asserts that hope locates itself in the premises that we don't know what will happen and that in the spaciousness of uncertainty is room to act. When you recognize uncertainty, you recognize that you may be able to influence the outcomes, you alone or in concert with a few dozen or several million others. Hope is an embrace of the unknown and the unknowable. It's the belief that what we do matters, even though how and when it may matter, who and what it may impact are not things we can know beforehand. And Solnit describes how sometimes we have to break down walls in order to catch a glimpse of the light. She writes, hope is not a lottery ticket. You can sit on the sofa and clutch, feeling lucky. 
It is an ax you break down doors with in an emergency. I really love this line, that hope is not a lottery ticket. You can sit on the sofa and clutch, feeling luck lucky. It's an ax you break down doors with in an emergency. Hope should shove you out the door because it will take everything you have to steer the future away from endless war, from the annihilation of the Earth's treasures and the grinding down of the poor and marginal. To hope is to give yourself to the future. And that commitment to the future is what makes the present inhabitable. As Jews, we give ourselves to the future by revisiting our past. We tell our stories over and over again. And in these stories, we see the truth of the braiding together of light and darkness always. Our narratives moving in spirals and waves. Our stories hold the keys to redemption. They link our past to our present and our future. They are amulets of hope. Our stories, our poetry are the axes we use to break down doors in an emergency. And so after everything we've endured, at the end of chanting Eicha tonight and tomorrow, we'll recite the verse, Hashiveinu Adonai Elecha v'nashuba chadesh yameinu kekedem. Take us back, God to yourself and let us come back, renew our days as of old. And we're taught that on Tisha B'Av, the Messiah will be born. Mm -hmm. To be a Jew is to never give up on the possibility of redemption. And I think part of the way we get there is by allowing ourselves to sit in the darkness, to be in the silence, to be with one another at the edge of the ocean of tears, to cry into that ocean of tears. And that's part of the way we, we ultimately access our own agency and the possibility of redemption. We're granted anti Shabaav as we sit in the thickness of our grief for what we have lost. We're granted what Rabbi Vicki Hollander calls night vision. And it's now getting darker and darker. We're, we're calling on our night vision. Odlo avda tikvatenu. We have not lost our hope yet. We have been here before, and we have a long way to go. We do not yet know what might emerge from these times, but we can trust in our night vision. So this Tisha B'Av, my moon people, I pray that we will sit in the darkness together with compassion, that we'll be with one another in the silence at the shore of the ocean of tears. May we cry out, may we open our hearts to the cries of others. May we be reminded that we carry the power tool of hope and the gift of night vision. And may we never give up on the possibility of redemption. Yai nai 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 nai